Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats Podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Balthazor. And I think we won the purple battle. <laughs> I think we may have. I, I think there's a chance that we did. I also think that we probably delivered a message unto them. <laughs> yes, uh, this game was a little chippy at times and uh, I think there's a lot of animosity between these teams now um I think this is the first game that there hasn't been a full-fledged fight uh or at least anything close to it in a while because back in 21 I know there was one I think in 22 we got close a couple times and big 12 title probably a two uh but there's just some uh trash talking and scuffling but nothing crazy in this game. But I, I think we did send an adequate message. Yeah, that, that's sort of how I would describe it. Is we, we sent a message. And uh, before we get into... Eh, we'll do that last. But this was a really good environment. Uh, obviously, fans were happy. Fans were pretty engaged. Uh, I didn't find anyone to bully on the TCU sideline. However, though, uh, maybe that could be for extenuating circumstances that maybe I didn't want to make myself heard as much. But, it's, um, yeah, it was really good environment, which I, I, we didn't get nearly as loud as it did against, like, during the UCF game, because, you know, we talked about it. There were several points during that game where we straight up couldn't hear each other think. Like, we, well, obviously, we're not hear each other think, but hear ourselves think. Yes. <laughs> but... Uh, also, another university has decided that they're going to try and get garbage time points in the last drive of the game. Uh, this time it was Sonny Dykes, and this time it resulted in one of our high school classmates getting hurt for no reason. So congratulations, Sonny Dykes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really getting the feeling that Chris Kleiman does not like Sonny Dykes <laughs> based off of his uh, um, some of his post-game comments. And... I've not really ever really liked Sonny Dykes, um, but I was trying to start gaining some respect for him as a coach after last year, but it's really all fallen through this season, especially with some of his conduct. Like, I mean, calling the timeouts is one thing, but then you, uh, with on the second to, like the second to last play of the game, uh, you injure one of your uh, important rotation guys at tight end. And uh, then you still keep trying to score a touchdown at the end rather than just run out the clock and, you know, read the writing on the wall. Like, it's not worth getting people hurt to not even cover the spread. <laughs> like, that wasn't going to help out. Like, it was it was just really, really stupid by TCU, and it only made them worse now going forward. Yep. But, yeah, that's pretty much the general spot now. Well, now we can begin the game day grade segment where we go through every single position group, including the coordinators, giving them a grade from F to A plus F, meaning they knew single-handedly lost us the game. Yeah, I guess how many of those are, how many of those those are, uh, and then A plus, meaning that they performed exceptionally well or near single-handedly won us the game. We're going to start with the quarterbacks, Will Howard and Avery Johnson. Will Howard. Three for 154, uh, three touchdowns. Avery Johnson, 5 of 10, 90 yards, one touchdown. And, of course, they both contributed on the ground as well. Uh, Will for 62 yards and then Avery for 93 yards. I Listen, I if this isn't an A-plus performance for the quarterbacks, I really don't know what is. Yeah, I mean, the only thing you could have asked for is just more touchdowns and... You're just, it doesn't really matter at that point. I mean, they combined uh, for four, and uh, they uh, um, probably could have had more opportunities to get some rushing touchdowns or something, but it just didn't end up mattering. I mean, Avery had 73 on the ground because he took that sack and lost like 13, yeah. uh, which was probably for the best because it would have been grounding otherwise. And uh, then um, Will... Uh, had a really nice rushing day, although pretty much all of his yards came on that first drive. Um, yeah, but this is an easy A plus for them. Uh, Will looked really in form um, as a passer. Uh, he didn't throw a pick for the uh, first time all year, 
uh, in a game and had three touchdowns. So he he looked really quality. Avery looked really good. He made some fantastic throws in this game, a few that he really dropped in the bucket. Uh, there was a lot to like about what we saw from both of the quarterbacks. And I, I do think that we expected to see both. I think everyone expected to see both. Um, I don't think anyone expected to see both on the first play of the game. Uh, technically, they both started. They did both start, yes. That, that will be a fun trivia thing in the future. But, uh, no, it was... They, they were managed pretty much perfectly, I think. Yeah, alternating drives and... You brought up a good point, so I'm going to let you say the point. You brought it up during the game. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that's really nice about having them alternate drives, which maybe we will do in the future, maybe we won't, uh, but it gives you the opportunity to have uh, two uh, scripts to start. Uh, you give Will a script for the first drive, and then you give Avery a script for a second drive. Uh, and... Because you, you get each quarterback, they get their own first drive, and so they each get a script. And doing that, you're going to have a more refined and generally more successful drive. Because scripts are, well, they're scripted for a reason. They're meant to exploit weaknesses in the, in the defense and play to some strengths. And it worked to perfection against TCU. We got up 14-0 pretty quickly. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, getting to opening drives uh, or opening scripts is uh, so, so, so valuable. Uh, and it's you're rarely, if ever, going to give one quarterback two opening drives. But when you just have, uh, when you have two quarterbacks and they only have to know one, uh, that makes it a lot easier. And it also helps when you have two quarterbacks with different but still overlapping skill sets. Like we saw Will get out there and have several really good runs on yeah. the first drive. So uh, they, um, TCU, mean, I mean, uh, they were still stacking the box for quite a while, but uh, we were still able to run it effectively. But then just to clear it up later, we started throwing it a bit more and they had to step away from the box and play more coverage. And then we really gashed them. I mean, that's, kind of diverging into other topics, but uh, having those scripts available to have two really quality possessions to start a game is invaluable. Yeah. Speaking of gashing, we can talk about the two running backs, uh, Treshawn Ward and DJ Giddens. This is another example of, yeah, no, this is two really easy A pluses because <laughs> the running backs were excellent. Uh, DJ, by the way, still really slow, still no moves. Uh, people were Still really stupid. <laughs> uh, Ward had himself a really good game as well. Both of them end up going for 89 and 85. Uh, Ward going 89 on the ground, DJ 85. And then uh, DJ adding 75 yards through the air. And then DJ, I mean, uh, Treshawn adding 17. So, you know, they both gr- scrape into the 100 yards from scrimmage. Mark, that's, that's an easy A+, plus again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I gave him an A plus too. Uh, Treshawn was really nice. He um, had two touchdowns. Uh, technically, one was receiving. It was basically a rush, mm-hmm. um, but his um, actual uh, legitimate rush uh, was fantastic. Uh, the ducking to avoid the, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of the same one. Uh, the ducking to avoid the uh, linebacker coming at him and just kind of walking into the end zone. Uh, was really good and I think is going to get ultimately get overshadowed by just how quality the rest of this game was. But it's a play worth remembering for Treshawn, who's um, really uh, rebounded, I think, in the last uh, few games to be putting up some really, really quality numbers. He's up over 400 on the ground uh, on the year and uh, nearly at 100, uh, about 11 away. Uh, but then, yeah, DJ continues to just be really 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 good uh there's not many complaints i think you can have about how he's been playing uh so far this year he's already got more carries than he did last year uh and more rushing yards uh very similar performance wise to what he did last year except just slightly better across the board and then he continues to be this unexpected receiving threat (laughs) we knew that he had good hands coming into the year but his hands are freaking massive yeah he's got gigantic hands 
and it helps him so much in the receiving game, but I don't think anybody expects him to be as much of a weapon as he's been. And he is, when DJ's on in the pass game, that makes everything so much easier for everyone else. Because all of a sudden you can't just not account for him at all. And obviously he's not deuce. Uh, nobody is. But he still is able to, I mean, he broke his 61-yard touchdown yesterday. And a lot of it just came from outrunning everyone. But he's so slow, by the way. Yes. I'm so sick of hearing that. But <laughs> he was awesome. Uh, DJ was awesome. Trayshawn was awesome. So A pluses for both of them. Yeah. Now receivers, uh, gonna be honest, I could be talked into a lower grade, but I also, spoilers, uh, no, like I said earlier, no one got below an A- minus for me. Let's talk about Jace Brown. <laughs> because, you know, all the other receivers, you know, Sands, KJ, had a pretty solid day. Uh, Phil, you know, three catches, 31. Um, no, actually, there were, there were only two receivers who recorded catches. I don't care. I'm still letting them have their A minus. So just by virtue of Jace Brown, the if okay, the there is exactly one route that gave this an A minus, and that's Jace Brown against in the red zone on that t- that touchdown pass from Will. If you have not seen the replay of that, Connor showed it to me before the episode. <laughs> that was one of the most disgusting routes I've ever seen a K State receiver run, ever. Yeah. <laughs> Bar I mean, none. Uh, we knew Jace Brown was going to be the route runner of this year's true freshman receiving class. And that's what's l- letting him get on the field so much early on. That is run, run blocking. Yeah, his run blocking has been <laughs> just unbelievable, especially for uh, somebody of uh, his um, his age and his stature. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's listed at 5'11", 174. Uh, he is not a gigantic person, but he... Uh, is a tenacious run blocker, but uh, you gave him an A minus. I gave him an A minus. Yeah. Did you have anything else to say about them? Not really. No. Okay. Uh, I give him a B plus. Um, if we if this game had been closer, I honestly probably would give them a lower grade. Um, but uh, yeah, Keegan Johnson had a couple rushes. Uh, Jaden Jackson had a 14 yard rush. I thought that he had a catch for some reason, but maybe he got called back for a penalty or it maybe. Did. Okay, okay. I'm I, I see. So that is unfortunate for Jaden Jackson. Really tough. But Phil had uh, three catches. Um, I remember one of them being pretty nice. The other one tried to be pretty nice, but it didn't really work. And I don't remember the last one. Uh, but Jace was awesome. He he was the face of the receiver room uh, in this one. He saw a snap count significantly increase. He earned playing time, and he made the most of it. And I think he has. At this exact moment in time, a pretty legit argument for being the best receiver on this roster. Like, at least he's playing the best of everybody who's getting time. Uh, So there's a lot to like about Jace Brown right now. I mean, four catches for 88 yards and a touchdown. I think he's earned the right to be a starter at this point. There's no reason he shouldn't be starting right now. And uh, his touchdown reception was awesome. Uh, the connection that he had with Avery on uh, both of those uh, deep balls was really, really, really nice. Uh, the early one in the first quarter, I couldn't tell that it was caught from where I was sitting, and so I had to watch the reaction of the nearest section. I thought he was out of bounds. Yeah, I kind of did too, but I honestly didn't even think he caught it at first because that's not a type of pass that we attempt much, and even more rarely complete. So I was a little surprised, but then Avery goes back to him on that uh, go ball a little later, and that was, again, another really great play. We haven't seen many of those this year, which is a a sideline go, Uh, but Jace looked really good on it. Um, Of course, Avery um, has a lot of touch um, on his passes, and I can tell he has a really strong arm, but he hasn't quite really uncorked it quite yet. But we know that he does have a strong arm. And I think he's really starting to grow a lot more as a passer as well. Uh, Which just getting those game reps will do so much. Uh, But yeah, other than Jace Brown and kind of Phillip Brooks, this was a not great week for the receivers. However, we won by 38 against (laughs) a team we really don't like. And they also all generally did really good run blocking, especially Jace. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go a little light on them. But... 
anyone not named Jace Brown and kind of Phillip Brooks needs to be, uh, I'm really starting to step up here in the next two weeks. I think Houston uh, is a big game for the receiver room. And of course, Texas is going to be a massive game for everybody. So we need the receivers to step up. I'm not asking them to be elite. I'm asking them to, to be conscious. If we can get like at least one catch from like the top four guys, like I won't be completely de- distraught as long as they're like decent gains, like ten plus yards, sure. like excluding Jace. I expect a little more from him now, but. <laughs> Uh, he, he's proven he can get open, so I, I now expect it. But the he, hilarious part about Jace is that he's prototypical wide receiver too, and he's doing this. Yep, that that's the thing. That's the thing with Jace. But he's he's the guy that's getting open right now. He's the hot hand, and the staff has shown that they'll roll with the hot hand for the most part. So uh, a B plus for the receivers, but they were just a couple guys away just getting involved not even being elite or being fantastic just like keegan johnson getting a catch or two or Jaden jackson getting a catch or two away from getting into the a range for me yeah uh tight ends full max i will be very interested because it we didn't see ben sinnott after like the second drive i don't think um gare oakley did very well in his stead um granted we weren't throwing the ball to him a ton uh, he did get called. The unfortunately, Christian Moore held, which removed the Gary Oakley touchdown off the board. Uh, Will Swanson had two pretty big catches: one for a touchdown, one for an important first down. I I gave them an A minus as well. Uh, I will be with morbid curiosity awaiting the depth chart and injury news regarding Ben Simmons because I would really prefer he played. Actually, you know. Controversial take here, so bear with me. I think I agree. I think I'd like Ben Sinnott to play as well. But, uh, yeah, tight ends, I give him an A- minus as well. I thought they run blocked uh, really well. Um, Oakley deserved that touchdown. Yes, it was holding. I don't care. Um, uh, I, I was so happy for Garrett Oakley to start getting a little bit more involved. Uh, I think he's getting open a lot. And I think the targets will increase, especially if Ben isn't able to go. Uh, but Will Swanson was, um, um, he looked pretty solid as well. It's obvious Oakley's the more natural receiver, but Swanson still brings a lot of value to the table. I think he's like a, like a souped up version of Sammy Wheeler in some ways, where he's a, he's a more natural receiver than Sammy was, uh, but not by a ton. Yeah. But I, I'd say that he's, probably just as good of a blocker if not better uh I, I like Swanson a lot as a blocker Oakley's experienced as a blocker but he hasn't been like abjectly awful or noticeably bad which is all you can ask for sometimes but the tight ends were pretty decent especially given that Benson did not play most of this game so that was asking a lot of them uh, but all in all I liked what I saw from them especially Oakley I really am waiting for his breakout game because just watching him he is just such a great mover for someone of his size so uh, just fingers crossed for the oakley breakout against texas i'll take houston too i guess <laughs> but texas would be nice as well so uh a minus for the titans yep offensive line i actually debated between my grade and a plus i gave them an a uh, I think Colin Klein has figured out that this is a much better pin and pull offensive line. I think he's figured that out. Um, because for a little while we were trying to do a lot of zone and a lot of a lot of zone, a lot of, you know, more lateral lateral plays as in east west as opposed to north south. Um, and now I think he's sort of figured out, no, this is a this is a physical pin and pull offensive line. We want to run a lot of power. We want to run a lot of counter. We want to get our offensive linemen on the move. Um, so why didn't I... We did that, and they pass blocked pretty well. Why didn't they get an A+. Plus? His name is Hayden Gillum, and the reason is four bad snaps. And it didn't go... It didn't end poorly, but the potential for it to end very poorly was there. And if there is one thing that Hayden Gillum cannot afford to be doing, it, it's having bad snaps. Yeah, 
it was really odd, too, because we've seen him have a few bad snaps before, but never this many all in one game. Um, and I think all of them were to Will as well, yep. which was strange. He's selling. I guess so. But <laughs> For the record, uh, no, he's not. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Still, Will did a good job corralling most of them, and we were very lucky that none of those uh, bad snaps ended up uh, really costing us anything. Uh, I mean, we still won by 38, so it's tough to complain. I gave them an A for almost the exact same reason. There were a couple of plays that could have turned into something where we had like one guy could just get kind of detonated at the line, but that's really splitting hairs, and it's not the main part of this grade because you just can't win every rep. Uh, my main issue was uh, the bad snaps this week. Hopefully it doesn't become a pattern. Uh, I doubt it will because that was highly unusual. Uh, for Hayden Gillum. Uh, he's been pretty good in the past. Um, even if we've had issues uh, with some of his blocking at times, we've never really had issues with him uh, snapping the ball. Yeah. So That was Noah Johnson's thing. <laughs> yes. So hopefully this is just an anomaly, knocking on wood, uh, and he'll have the week to fix whatever issue it was, and uh, uh, it'll hopefully be better going forward. But yeah. Other than that, really, the offensive line was generally really good. There was a Cooper BB highlight that was circulating in scouting circles for the NFL. Uh, KT Leviston had, I forget who was running the football, but there was one particular running play where he just detonated he just someone. someone. He, yeah. pulled, he turned someone into pulled pork, and there's nothing yeah. they could have done about it. No, it really was a shame, and it could have <laughs> happened to anybody. But KT has been really good. He's been coming along. This wasn't Panzer's best game at all, but uh, he it wasn't enough to affect the outcome at all. Uh, Carver Willis has been pretty good, honestly. Uh, he's taken a massive step uh, since the uh, first three games of the year. Uh, he's pulling a Mike Gundy, I guess, uh, right. out at right tackle. But right. <laughs> uh, And then um, Duffy was fine. Uh, Trevor Poitier was fine as well. We got some guys rotated in there, but yeah. Offensive line gets an A. I think this was their best game on the year, um, other than the snaps uh, being an issue. But that's just one guy. I think collectively, though, this was their best game. Uh, UCF is close, but I think that this one probably gets out in front. Probably so. Now we can switch to the defensive side of the ball. I'm just going to start with the defensive line. All of, I mean, the entire defense played well. I would say that the defensive line performed the worst out of the three position groups. But they still had themselves a really good game. Amani Bailey did end up going for 100, and some of that was defensive linemen kind of getting shoved out of the way. But we were also getting a lot of pressure on Hoover. Not a lot of sacks. In fact, I think a defensive lineman only got one sack. That would be Javon Banks. Um, But we were constantly in Hoover's face. We were making him uncomfortable, which that's what you want your defensive line to do, really. Uh, they weren't game wreckers, but honestly, they were doing well enough. It was really funny trying to watch a bunch of people try to move Uso uh, from the pile and watching it not work. That play was one of my favorites on the day, just because mm-hmm. it was funny. Um, but I gave them an A-. Uh, really good uh, in getting pressure. You just really want them to convert maybe a few more of those pressure opportunities. Yep. Uh, defensive line, what would you say grade was? A-. minus. Okay. I gave them the same grade. Um, an A minus. Uh, again, uh, just a, a few issues in uh, um, run gaps. They a couple times gave up uh, those big runs. Some of that was on the linebackers as well, though. There were a few times. There's even a time Austin Moore got uh, kind of um, distracted on a run play and missed his gap just yeah. a little bit, uh, which is pretty unusual. Uh, but the defensive line did struggle a few times there. But they again, they were getting pretty consistent pressure. Brendan Mont nearly had a sack at one point. I think Duke got pretty close a couple times. There was a, a lot to like about how they played. They just had the unfortunate distinction of being the least good on a night of very, very good defense. Yeah. I mean, because the only time TCU scored... I'll leave that for Klanerman, never mind. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they were good. Uh, they were barely sure tacklers. They all played very high motor uh, majority of the night. Uh, we got some rotational guys in near the end. Uh, we saw some Jace Friesen. Uh, I think we saw some Donovan Ryman as well. 
uh, which I, I like getting Ryman in. I was about to say young guy. Chase Friesen's been here for like 20 years, <laughs> but, so he doesn't count. Perennial uh, break entertainment haver, yeah. Chase Friesen. Yeah. Every player-based... <laughs> Uh, like entertainment bit that they do, like in media timeouts, Jace Friesen always ends up in them. He's always in there, like with the headphones on, like trying Nick to Allen. guess the song. Yeah, he's just like pretty much exactly like Nick Allen in that regard. But I was pretty happy with how the defensive line performed uh, for the most part. So a minus. Linebackers. Only thing that kept them from an A plus was they didn't have the greatest tackling day. Austin Moore has been weirdly off. In terms of tackling these last few weeks, uh, Romaine was out, but Clifton subbed in as the main Mike linebacker. He honestly might be better. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's not because Austin Romaine is bad, it's just because Clifton's kind of on another level. <laughs> um, yeah. But there, I don't have any real big complaints other than the occasional missed tackle. I ended up just giving them an A. I gave them an A as well. Um, I There was a couple times where... Um, it looked like Austin Moore or someone else uh, didn't quite fill the gap they needed to, but that was really it. Um, Desmond Purnell was fantastic in this game. I think this was maybe his best game as a Wildcat. He had a few massive run stops. Uh, he and Austin Moore combined for a sack uh, early in the game. I think they announced it as Desmond Purnell, but it was a half sack uh, on the official record. Um, Purnell got his first career interception as well. A really nice diving one. If we want to get to backups, Rex Van Wyn nearly had a uh, another interception late. He should have had it. It went right through his hands. It's a 28-foot yeah. tall linebacker. Yeah, it is <laughs> unbelievable. Not just how tall he is, but how long his arms are. I mean, that that's not a play any other linebacker on the roster could have made other than maybe Asa Newsom. Maybe. Asa Newsom would have probably just deflected it, though. And so, I mean, there, there's a lot to like about this. I like, again, Clifton, I think, is probably the better linebacker right now than Romaine. The only reason I don't think he starts over Romaine is because Clifton's the best backup at every single spot. Yeah. That's the only reason he doesn't start right now is basically like they, they need him for every other spot. And that's no fault of his own. He's, it, it's, well, technically it is. He's very good, and that's his own fault. But... <laughs> He's, he was awesome. Uh, the linebackers in general were really good, I thought, uh, but they get an A from me. Yep. Defensive backs, they arguably had the best game for the defensive unit, at least in my opinion they did. Uh, Will Lee ended up being back this game. We held TCU under 200 passing yards. They had a long of 16. That doesn't happen against a unit this talented. Like it, that's just so unbelievably rare for that to happen. You know, Keenan Garber, again, he's starting to get himself into position more. Jacob Parrish is still just as sticky as before. And Will Lee didn't look like he lost a step after missing Texas Tech last week. The safeties are still good. Kobe Savage is still a juice guy. Siegel has stepped up massively, and VJ Payne has stepped into his role. There is... I. It's rare for me to say that I don't have any complaints for the defensive backs. I don't. I have no complaints, and that's an A-plus performance. Yeah. I mean, the really only one mistake they had on the day that was significant was the uh, Willie pass interference. Yeah. That was it. That was really it. I, I gave him an A-plus. Uh, but that was the only time they messed up, and they only got a field goal out of it. TCU, I mean. And that was it. Other than that, they were fantastic. As a team in total, we had six uh, pass breakups or pass deflections, however you score it. Um, but there were a few late in the game that were pretty nice. Jordan Wright had one on the goal line. Unfortunately, he got penalized for doing the thumbs down, which I'm not sure why they got him that time. Cowardly behavior. Yeah, never got him any other time. The Kendra Steiger had one on the very last play of the game to prevent a touchdown. Uh, Keenan Garber had two, Jacob Parrish had one, uh, and then of course Rex Van Wy had the one we talked about earlier, but uh, it was a really good day for the uh, defensive backs. Uh, Marquis Siegel was not credited with one, I think he maybe could have had one, except that was also partially uh, just an errant throw behind, I think, J.P. Richardson maybe, Yeah. but all in all the defensive backs were really good. 
very, very, very few mistakes. I think Kobe Savage might have like missed time to hit at one point and let a run go a little further, but it's tough to complain about that stuff when it's not really harming us. Mm-hmm. It's just important to keep in mind that you know there will be teams better than that are a lot better than TCU that we'll have to face that are going to take advantage of that a little better than TCU did. So just stuff to keep in mind. But all in all, I thought that the defensive backs were really quality. I think this was their best game on the year. Um, they're in a run of good form right now. I hope that continues because uh, we're going to really need it in these uh, next few games. Yeah. Now we can get on to the coordinators, Colin Klein and uh, Joe Klanderman. Both get A pluses, both called nearly perfect games, in my opinion. And I I don't really have anything else to say other than that. Colin Klein has once he figured out that this is a pin and pull offensive line and was able to get Avery involved in the running game, I feel like this this offense so far looks like it has unlocked another gear. Uh, and that's even with Will in the game. He's now comfortable doing those quarterback running plays which you know when you whenever you're running like counter bash or you're just doing a straight qb power it's almost impossible for a defense to learn that or not not necessarily learn it but counter that when you also have the ability to bomb it downfield uh which avery has proven he can do uh will still can throw intermediate which is enough to justify it but and then Klanderman. Listen, man, they, they, they didn't score a single touchdown. They got a sad field goal at the very beginning of the game. He gets an A-plus. Of course he does. Yeah. Uh, Colin Klein, A-plus. I loved um, the management of the quarterback situation. Um, of course, I say that because it worked. But, yeah. Um, they, it was one of the better managements of having two quality quarterbacks that I've seen in a while. And I think that they were able to kind of take a two QB system and find a way to make it work in a, um, in a really pleasing way. Um, they were able to make it to where they had just enough overlap in what they'd be doing to make defenses stay honest. Um, they were able to do a good job of managing the personalities around it, which I imagine was one of the easier parts of doing that. Because there's so many things that make a 2QB system difficult. One of the biggest ones generally is going to be the ego of quarterbacks. Uh, but they're, they're pretty lucky in that Will and Avery are the quarterbacks. Um, I, I think that they did a good job of staying consistent uh, with it and creating situations for both quarterbacks to be really successful in. And that's exactly what we saw was both quarterbacks be very successful. And we saw Avery very obviously have the higher ceiling. Um he had several runs that were just shoestring tackles away from really breaking off for a touchdown. Uh, several would have been very long touchdown runs if not for a diving last second stop by TCU's defense. And Will was really great as well. He managed the game really effectively and had some really quality throws. His throw to Jace Brown in the end zone was a really good pass. That was some Will Howard of last year that we uh, got used to seeing. Uh, this is the most confident Will's looked in a while, I think. And Avery was exactly as we've seen him uh, before, just cool, cool as a cucumber. So Klein gets an easy A plus uh, for not only managing that situation well, but generally making the TCU defense look completely incompetent. I mean. They did not look like they knew how to stop us at all the entire night. And when they did, it felt more like luck yeah. than them actually doing something right. <laughs> so a lot of credit to Colin Klein for his best game on the year. And, and I think you said it best with Klanderman. We didn't give up a touchdown. And the one score that we gave up was uh, from a, a basically a DPI call, get, allowing them to convert like a third and 18 when uh, it otherwise would have been a punt because the ball is probably out of reach regardless. So, yeah, really, really, really nice stuff from the defense. So, Klanderman gets an easy A+. This is probably his best game on the year. Yeah. So, we we spent a lot of time in game day grades and whatnot talking about, even with wins, 
how we'll say, oh, this was a win, but it felt like we played like a C plus or B minus game overall or B game. Like we're obviously better than this. This was about the closest that we've been all year to really reaching the pinnacle of our best play. And the only thing holding us back is still receivers, I yep. think. It's always going to be receivers at this point, I think, this year. Yeah, I, th- I think that's going to be the only weakness, but Jace is stepping up, and uh, if more young guys can continue to step up, that might change things. So uh, I'll, I'll keep the faith for now. But this was as close to K-State's best that we've seen so far. Yep. Now I'm getting to MVPs. This one, I think... Actually, offense, I think, has a lot of really good picks. Um, I am going to go with DJ Giddens, largely because two touchdowns on the day. Wait. Mostly because of the... Yep, it was two. It was two touchdowns. Mm -hmm. I had to verify. (laughs) Uh, You know, DJ wants... I think DJ at home is a completely different monster than DJ away. Uh, I, At least that's what it's been so far. But... There are so many good options, and I have a distinct feeling you're going to pick the other one I was thinking of as my number two. Okay. Uh, well, we'll see if we are, we're are we on the same page here. But, see if we hive-minded again. Because uh, I was thinking DJ, and I think you're right. There were a lot of really quality candidates. I think on the preview, I just said the quarterbacks, Yeah. Um, which I think is a fine option, but I'm not going to go with them. I'm going to go with Jace Brown. Is that who you thought I was going to yep. pick? Yeah. I, I'm going to give the true freshman his flowers. I think he deserves it for having, I think, the best game for a receiver all year when you level it to the competition. You don't even have to level it to competition. It's not close. Yeah. Well, RJ had a pretty solid first game. But that's oh, I guess that's true. But it was also against South Dakota. So No, it was uh, SEMO. Oh, right. Right, right, right. SEMO. <laughs> I forgot already. But the uh, Jace Brown, I mean, he was awesome. His first uh, game with really extended playing time, uh, he probably played 40 or 50 snaps in this game. I'm, I don't have the PFF numbers in, in front of me, but it doesn't really matter, I guess. He, it looked like he played a lot, so he probably played a lot. <laughs> um, he was leading receivers, a true freshman, a, a relatively unheralded true freshman as well. And the connection between him and Avery was pretty obvious, I think. Uh, they, there was a lot of trust there, especially uh, on Avery's side of it. Uh, for Jace to get open or for Jace to make the tough catch. And that was there with Will as well. Uh, Jace was able to get himself really open. Uh, the TC defender still closed some uh, on that touchdown, but Jace ran a fantastic route, and Will put it exactly where it needed to be. But Jace made a lot of things happen for the offense. Uh, even with just four catches, his impact was immense. Yep. On the defensive side of the ball, I think there's really, there's an obvious pick, and it's Des Purnell. Yep. You and I were in agreement on that before the interception. (laughs) pick, it was the next play. Yeah, we had had already decided on it uh, in the game, you know, that he was going to be the MVP, and the very next play he gets the pick, and that just solidified it. Des was awesome. This was his best game in a K-State uniform. Uh, He was flying all over the place, and... Uh, in a game where Austin Moore had fairly similar stats, had a few more blunders that don't show up on the stat sheet, but not a lot, Des Purnell really showed up and was there to pick up any slack. Uh, his run defense was really awesome, which we already know about how good his run defense is. Um, he adds half a sack, and uh, the pick, of course, was a, a really nice pick as well. So he's easy. That's, a, that's an easy pick right there. Yeah. Now to just sort of put a bow on the episode, I think the most important thing from this game is that you don't start feeling yourself again, because bad things have happened whenever this team has started feeling itself a bit too much, and you just have to keep the momentum going from a big victory against a Houston squad that, let's just say, is flawed. They're flawed, but they somehow stick in a lot of games. They have no business being in a lot of the games that they've been in, but nevertheless, they've been right there for uh, quite a few games, especially recently. They're kind of finding their stride a little bit, um, but it's it's tough to gauge them, which I don't like. Yeah, I don't like that either. Um, another thing is 
just let's just give Jace Brown another set of flowers here because we we said that he was probably the guy who's most likely to make an immediate impact. Um, we he's not, and the hilarious thing is he's probably not the most talented guy in this receivers class. Yeah, that's but, still traced by me. Yeah, he probably doesn't even have the first or second highest ceiling in no, this class. He uh, doesn't. It's probably Spivey and Davis. Yeah. So, uh, but Jace is just the glue guy that's just always going to be open, and every every team should have one of those. And we've not always had one of those. At times, it's been Philip Brooks, but it hasn't always been Philip Brooks. If Jace Brown can just consistently be the guy. That's gonna get you the first down when you need it. That's gonna find ways to get open downfield at times and force the defense to stay honest. And he's gonna be so 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 valuable. For you, State. you remember two weeks ago when I was talking about Miles Price and how his job was to be the annoying guy who was always somehow open. Yep. That's Jace Brown, and that is so beautiful to see in a K State uniform. But, no, I'm just top-down. I'm very happy with this performance. Um, But you still have your back against the wall in terms of going to Arlington. You can't let up. And I just hope... I don't think that this is a team that's going to let one big victory let them take take their foot off the gas. I think they realize that they still have to come out and they still have to play everyone that's left on the schedule. Which, the next game on the schedule is Houston, which we've already mentioned. But do you have any, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, yeah, just take Houston seriously. They almost had Texas, or they almost beat Texas uh, this weekend, who consequently is our next game, uh, which there's all sorts of stuff going on in Texas right now. Won't get into that too much. I mean, it doesn't really matter for us. No. Like, we're not on the team. It doesn't matter if we look ahead. <laughs> but... Um, uh, Houston, they're going to be a quality opponent. We've seen Donovan Smith before, so I don't know how much that'll help. Uh, but we were generally pretty good against him last year. We got to him a lot in the backfield. But uh, regardless, it's set up to be an exciting game. Uh, if we win that game, we'll be bowl eligible, uh, which I guess is not the first thing on our minds right now. Yeah. But that and also you said about you know not letting up. Uh, yeah, we're in a four-way tie for second place in the conference right now. So, if we we need basically right now to win out and have Oklahoma State lose a game, and that's it. So all we need to do is simply win five games in a row. It's that easy. Or we win out, Oklahoma State drops to Oklahoma, and because of common conference opponents and record, we probably beat Oklahoma for the tiebreaker. Okay. <laughs> sure. We're looking ahead. Let's not do that. <laughs> but that pretty much wraps up this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. If you want to follow us, you can follow us just about anywhere at Aggieville A Cats. If you want to email us, we're AggievilleAlleyCats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at ACEdward00. I am at Connor Balthazor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store. Link in the podcast and Twitter bios. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats.